Welcome to the University of Oxford Museum of Natural History. To all of you here in the room and to everybody that's joining us live, I hope the streaming is working. It's wonderful to have you all here tonight to mark this occasion with SEI. I can see lots of friends, long-time friends, colleagues, affiliates, interns of SEI and colleagues and partners from many other organisations. Some we've only met virtually, it's great to have you here, and lots of new faces, people I've never met. Welcome, and I hope we can work together and get to know each other better. My name is Ruth Butterfield, and I'm the Centre Director of SEI in Oxford. Thank you all, particularly for making the journey to Oxford. Some have come quite considerable distances, and for making the time to be with us, both here in the, in the museum and online. And a special thank you to our event participants for lending us their expertise as we mark this special occasion. We want to observe this milestone in our journey in the same way we try to conduct our day-to-day -day work, by bringing people and organisations together to bridge research, policy, practice, and to help build capacity and learn from each other. With COP27 in a couple of months and in Africa for the first time, the global stock take is well underway and the regular heartbreaking reports of climate extremes resulting in terrible human suffering, there's never been a more important time for us working on matters concerning climate resilient development and sustainability to push our agendas forward to advance knowledge and action on these issues. The nature of this occasion is our anniversary after all requires at least a bit of a backward look. 20 years ago, we were so excited about new, a new gadget that allowed you to do something we never thought of before, to carry all your music around with you in a tiny device, smaller than a pack of cards, it was an iPod. Also, an orthodox multi-authored encyclopedia had also been created. It was totally online, generated by anonymous contributors from around the world using their PCs. It was called Wikipedia. These will be mentioned later, they are relevant. <laughs> in the early 2000s, adaptation was only starting to surface as a concept, coming out of responses to climate variability and also the impacts work, mostly on agriculture and crops. A few researchers, including some at Oxford and also very much in the wider SEI, were just beginning to address the issue. In Oxford in those early days, there was just four of us looking at social issues and impacts related to climate risk. Three of us are here tonight. Kate Longsdale, over here. <laughs> so Kane of Arwani and I. Um, Tom Downey, who was the founder in Oxford, unfortunately, is celebrating his birthday and isn't here tonight. We're very proud to have established a team that has not only continued for, for two decades, but has retained its relevance. Times, research and funding agendas have changed and we have managed through the ups and downs to adapt. In our early work to reduce the vulnerability of communities and sectors, we could see that multiple actors with many different kinds of knowledge and experience would have to come together. It was the start of our signature participatory approach to our research. So we practice playing, role playing to facilitate discussion and identify actions to support watersheds in Europe, I think this was. This was Kate's idea. <laughs> we took on the roles of coastal farmer, landowner, water company executive and environmental aid agency representative. We didn't discover any natural or hidden acting talents, but we did discover a shared passion for including different voices and ideas in the debate and learning from walking in other shoes. Adaptation issues at that time struggled to gain attention. It was sort of the ugly stepsister to mitigation, largely because of the tendency to think that addressing adaptation somehow meant giving up on trying to reduce emissions and limit temperature rise. Despite this lack of international attention, five years down the line, we pioneered a wiki, pioneered a wiki to share learning on climate adaptation, Wiki Adapt. This grew into a global adaptation knowledge network and platform covering multiple themes, which now reaches 200 countries and hundreds of thousands of people each year. There was a lengthy discussion at the time about the name. After much debate, 
we settled on Weird Out, a signature which chose to reflect the collaborative nature of the work. This was our take on the prevailing trend at the time of the iPod and iPhone, much more individualistic, but the we in Weird Out has served us well over the, over the years. Of course, our history is still in the making. In the 20 years since our work in Oxford began, climate change has become increasingly high profile and urgent due to record setting temperatures, storm intensity, sea level rise, droughts and floods and so on, particularly because the world has yet to really grapple with it successfully. Once only a term used in academic discussion, the use of adaptation is now often in news stories and reports from the cops and is finally recognised as a global concern, requiring imminent action of finance. Those of us assembled here know well that actions have yet to rise to the challenge. In the UK, for example, the Climate Change Committee concluded last year that adaptation action in the country had failed to keep pace with worsening, the worsening reality of climate risk. The committee co concluded that Alarmingly, the gap between the level of risk we face and the level of adaptation underway has widened. As researchers, policy makers, practitioners, we know that the risks of climate to individuals, communities, cities and regions in all economies around the world is also compounded by many other stresses, conflict, insecure energy supply, political extremism, the continuing pandemic and, dare I say, an imminent recession, just to mention some of them. It's easy to feel overwhelmed at the size of the challenges. However, we mustn't underestimate the capacity for humankind to rise to this occasion, particularly in times of crisis. In the past 20 years, we've seen the unimaginable become commonplace in every day. Two dec decades ago, no one carried a smartphone and we didn't use Wi-Fi. Gene editing, 3D printing, artificial intelligence, now widespread in multiple industries and endeavors were in their early stages of development. The sensation of the early 2000s, the iPod, is now obsolete. But we're happy to say that We Adapt is celebrating its 15 years, its 15 years anniversary, along with our 20 year anniversary. And the new technologies and fun functional advances in web, de web, web design mean that we're we reaching wider audiences and bridging the silos that are in the climate change science arena. These are good reminders that things can change and quickly and together with our partners, with you and with the help of our funders, we hope to navigate, continue to navigate this path together. So finally, I just wanted to say some thank yous. Obviously, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> it's not an activity we do alone. So I would particularly like to thank our partners and funders from all over the globe including development banks, bilaterals, universities and so on, NGOs, and particularly to the Swedish government for our core support, without whom we wouldn't have made this journey. And we've learned so much from our partners along the way. To our many talented employees, affiliates and interns who have come through our doors, a lot have gone on to great careers in different universities and other climate organisations, and they continue to champion our work, and particularly our Weird to work as well. To SEI, the leadership in Stockholm from the Global Institute, which is now some 300 people strong in seven countries. And of course, to my wonderful colleagues here in our own centre. I'm going to introduce them in a minute. I can't take the time to detail all our work, um, but though we do centre and focus our work on adaptation, we also cover other areas, including climate services, nature based solutions, animal welfare, just transitions to lower meat diets, and of course, knowledge co-production. Uh, today, all our staff are wearing green badges, like this one, with our logos on. <laughs> so they should be identifiable. Um, we have colleagues here from York, I think, yes, York and Stockholm. I don't think any of the other centres. Um, I'd like them all to stand up to sort of recognise their contribution and also their contribution to the anniversary today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. Turning to our activities for the evening, we're focusing on the future of adaptation. So we're going to kick off with a panel discussion led by 
Karen Brandon, who's down here, our Senior Communications Officer. She's going to lead a panel discussion on scaling and speeding up adaptation. Then Rob, Watt, our Communications Director, will then moderate a fireside chat. And our SCI De Deputy Director, Orsa, will uh, make some closing remarks. This will close the formal part of the evening and we'll leave our lovely colleagues who are following us online. We'll conclude the evening with drinks, canapes and cakes downstairs in the main court of the, of the uh, museum. And this is an opportunity for you to have a look at some posters of our work and uh, videos of our tools and so on. So with that, I'll turn over to Karen. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you enjoy your evening. Yes, thank you, Ruth. As she said, I'm Karen Brandon. I'm the senior editor and a communications officer here. And it's my privilege to introduce our topic tonight and also to introduce all our panelists who bring just a wealth of knowledge. So um, in a nod to our setting, I am introducing our topic why um, ripping out a page found in a naturalist notebook. Behold the homo sapien. An extraordinarily adaptable creature, she lives in incredibly inhospitable places, in extreme cold, debilitating heat, and on the planet's tallest peaks where oxygen itself is scant. The species is characterized by fascinating contradictions unlikely to be ever fully understood. DNA analysis reveals a complex mix, genius, ignorance, altruism, barbarity, and stardust. I think there is a display of that out there somewhere. A field guide to the species indicates that while man has accumulated great stores of knowledge on climate change, he has thus far failed to mitigate or adapt to it. Field observations record the following pattern of behavior. Early discovery of the problem, followed by an extensive period of widespread disbelief. Swift understanding about the sources of the problem, followed by a prolonged period of denial. Rapid recognition about how to fix these problems, followed by ongoing debate about who should do what and who should pay for it. Thus, this species finds himself and herself, if I'm honest, in a crisis of his and her own making, not yet mitigating the sources that threaten his and her habitat and not yet adequately adapting to the threats that can no longer be mitigated. A growing number of extreme and deadly weather events appear to have made some members of the species far more aware that they can no longer choose whether to mitigate or adapt, and in fact, that they must do both. There's some early evidence that understanding is growing that adapting to climate change does not mean giving up on mitigating it. Our, this species is capable of doing two things at once, at least so long as it's not texting and driving. Longtime observers of the species document that at such times of crisis, uh, the species tend to display their best and worst characteristics. And this is a species, after all, that first created primitive tools out of the Stone Age period, and now has managed to devise extraordinary implements, things those people in the early days could never have imagined, technologies that allow the species to glimpse the component parts of the atom and to peer into galaxies billions of years away. Human beings write their own story and the pen is in their hands. And that was the end, mercifully, of the script from the naturalist who is clearly an amateur. Now I bring us here to the panel that brings the full expertise. I am so grateful that we have these people who can share their expertise, their experience, their insights, their knowledge, and they've all traveled and made a great effort to be here with us tonight. So now I'm going to introduce them. I want to begin by welcoming Yusuf Nasef. Uh, wave your hand. 
the director of the adaptation division of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, or as though of us, those of us who are hip say the UNFCCC, Natalie Seddon. And she is a professor of biodiversity and a senior associate at the International Institute for Environment and Development here at the University of Oxford. And she's also a senior fellow at the Oxford Martin School. Lisa Shipper. There she is, is an SEI associate and soon to be professor of development geography at the University of Bonn. And then I welcome Magnus Benzi, who is one of our research fellows from SEI Stockholm and from right here at home, Sukena Barwani, senior research fellow at SEI Oxford. I know this is a crowd who loves their acronyms, so I'm giving you all one, the triple A, the Adaptation Action Accelerator. Are you ready? Yusuf, why don't you kick us off? Because we have three questions we're going to discuss tonight, and the, they're all broad and interrelated. What would you say are the main goals for adaptation? Um, thank you, Karen. Um, allow me to reinterpret the question, uh, because uh, <laughs> um, if you take it at face value, you may assume that there is one um, one goal for adaptation, that, and that it's a standalone thing. But um, I think we've, we've changed our mindset from the days when we used to ask adapting to what. Now we need to ask adapting towards what. Where do we want to land as a result of this adaptation action? And um, I would um, propose that there are four levels um, of ambition in terms of what goals of, on adaptation um, we should assume. And we've been talking about this a lot in the context of the global goal on adaptation discussions. And, and in, in looking at the goal, another mindset shift is that we're not just adapting to the world as we see it today, but the future world is not just today's world plus a climate change signal. It's a totally different world. So we need to look at where we want to be in that future world. And we heard from, um, from Ruth about uh, the transformation, the technological transformation we've seen over the past two decades. So let's imagine what the technological transformation that's coming in the, in the next few years will land us, all the way from AI, big data, Internet of Things, uh, satellites, uh, biotechnology, and what are the implications of, of these technologies, both as opportunities and as challenges in terms of haves and have-nots, but also in how it can be used um, to reduce risk. So, um, so taking that into account, um, if I were to identify the adaptation goals, um, for some, it may be just survival. If you're a country, if you're an island that uh, expects to sink in the coming few decades, so the, the goal for, for that community is to avoid disappearing. Now, if uh, you're like many countries who submit their reports to the UNFCCC, um, the goal is to just undo, undo the climate um, impacts that are, are, there, uh, are expected to, to come your way, which means you're looking at retaining the status quo. For others, now going to the third level of ambition there, it could be to sort of merge your adaptation priorities with your developmental priorities in terms of, for example, achieving the SDGs and retaining them in a climate change world. And here's where I say adaptation is not standalone, but links to everything else. So that's a world where you've achieved your development goals and sustained them in a climate change world beyond 2030. And the fourth one, which I find really interesting and responds to what the science has told us since 2018, um, is the transformational threshold. We've been told that we need to transform in the coming decade or else we're doomed, both by the IPCC and by IBES the year after in 2019. And so what does that mean? Perhaps for a country it means that it will transform from being an LDC to being a middle-income country by 2025, and there are countries who have that goal. And how do you do that in the presence of climate impact? So increasing your resilience to enable whatever transformation or aspirational state, new state, that you want to, to get to. So, the answer to the question is that it's in the eye of the beholder. It depends on the level of ambition, it depends on the context today, but more importantly, it depends on the context tomorrow, and that's what's usually forgotten in many of our assessments. So that's my two cents worth to start with. Thank you. Thought provoking. Uh, Natalie, can you weigh in on that as well? Yeah. Yes, of course. With pleasure. Um, so I think <laughs> those are all extremely important observations, and I wholeheartedly agree. I think I want to add to that. I think 
Maybe an overarching one could be the rapid scaling up of fundamentally place-based holistic approaches to tackling the impacts of climate change. And by holistic, I mean three key things which in themselves could perhaps be framed as adaptation goals. One of them is to ensure that we think not just about reducing exposure to the impacts of climate change, but also thinking about how we reduce sensitivity and critically how we build adaptive capacity. So holistic in that sense, holistic in ensuring that we're thinking about can an adaptation program tackle multiple societal challenges simultaneously? So thinking beyond adaptation, thinking about can it also address mitigation, biodiversity, conservation and poverty alleviation? Because in so doing, those interventions are much more likely to be sustained over time for various reasons. And also thinking holistically in terms of who benefits, so ensuring the equitable distribution of those benefits in a way that respects land rights, human rights and in fact the rights of all living being, beings. And I think, and you'll probably go, I knew you were going to say this, but I think that clearly we need to scale up nature-based approaches because while we do need technology and there's already been quite a lot of discussion of tech mention of technology a lot of that technology simply isn't ready to go to scale and yet nature-based solutions which traditional communities and local communities have been using for millennia to deal with the impacts of climate change are already there a scalable a flexible some ecosystems can actually um, evolve and adapt to the impacts of climate change and there's growing evidence that those interventions can be especially over time when the plural values of nature are taken into account it can be much more cost effective or at least have much higher benefit to cost ratios. So those are sort of like, you know, the key components. And clearly we need to understand how nature and technology and behavioural solutions can work together. But I think that all needs to be enfolded into an adaptation goal. Thank you. Lisa, could you also weigh in? Yes. Thanks. I mean, so I think the question is really um, sort of, <laughs> the question is also the answer to the next question about the barrier to adaptation. Um, because I, I think picking up a little bit on also when, on Yusuf said, you can also slice it differently. So it's, it's also adaptation. What are the goals for adaptation when it's laid out in the science as a kind of ideal type of adaptation, which I think is what most of us who work in this space are really happy. You know, this is the kind of adaptation that we'd like to see. I think what Natalie described just now is a, that kind of adaptation. Uh, but then we also have the policy process. And the policy process is very largely detached from that scientific ideal version of adaptation. And then we have the practice, which is also somehow detached a bit from all of the other two. And so I think the, the challenge with adaptation, to some extent, is that there are these goals that we can articulate in a kind of academic way that just don't actually happen in the policy or in the practice. But, and, and here the, the challenge is really about um, the funding architecture and the, the policy architecture, but we'll get to that, we'll talk about barriers. But I think it is also that adaptation over time has evolved from this policy kind of side activity for some people to now a very central policy goal uh, for everybody. And, and that has also meant that we need to really think about how can we, can we practically do this. And um, from that perspective, I think we actually just honestly have to park the fact that we cannot do that kind of adaptation that we'd love to do, that ideal adaptation, that is not going to happen in practice. And so the goals for adaptation have to be scaled back, not up or out, uh, because what we're seeing is, I would call, and you've, some of you may have heard me talk about this, like hijacked adaptation. It's another kind of adaptation. It's a reduced form of, of, of implementable, projectizable adaptation. So maybe that means we need to push more transformation as a narrative. Uh, but, but I think this is the big question, is what actually are the goals for adaptation? And, and um, Unfortunately, I cannot quite read what I've written here, but... Uh, oh, no, okay, so... so um, the, the challenge, I think, is, yes, it's all this work on adaptation and it's degraded my eyesight, but I think the, the, the other way to think about it also is sort of the, the I guess, um, counterpoint to that is also that in many places what we're seeing now, I mean, we know from IPCC, AR6, that temperature levels are an adaptation limit that we cannot adapt in many places when we go over 1.5. And we're already seeing that in many places, even before 1.5. So 
the question I think that, that emerges is, are also these development paradigms, the development models, the development approaches that we have actually also a limit to adaptation? And in that sense, it doesn't really matter. I mean, we have climate change and if we're reducing um, the the greenhouse gas emissions, great. But I mean, it's is it also, are we focusing enough on the development processes that are probably very much a limit and are not going to allow us to adapt in many places? So, um, so again, you know, that brings back to is a goal about rethinking development, as we you know, talked about in the more radical days, in the early days, could we still have, can we still have radical adaptation, I guess, maybe is what I should finish on. I'm, I'm wondering if either one of my SEI colleagues would like to weigh in on this. Try? Yeah. Um, so maybe just, I mean, linking to the sort of uh practice side of things and again yet yeah, this i think touches on the barriers i think linking this uh the, the adaptation goals to practice the, the the main barriers come when trying to incorporate multiple voices that are experiencing the largest inequalities and i think the needs of marginalized groups when it comes to devi devising this policy are what's missing so having multiple voices around the table when creating these um, goals like adapting towards what and being holistic like what is the context of tomorrow really depends on having the voices around the table that can describe what is being experienced now what is the lived experience now and a lot of the policy that uh, the reason why practice fails so often is because these voices are not included in that design process in an adequate way and you know, when we talk about programming, adaptation programming, one of the biggest barriers is still that there is not enough social science integration in the physical science that is ongoing. Um, and I mean, the sad thing is, you know, we've been talking about this for 20 years since we started SEI, but you know, a lot of the same problems are still there. Magnus, you have a minute. I'll be really quick. <laughs> and I'll maybe um, drift into the temptation of a scientific or conceptual answer that Lisa said is not enough. But um, a goal of adaptation should be, in my view, systemic resilience. And what I mean by that is we can adapt nodes as individual systems or individual places, and that might be successful at that local scale or for a certain group of people. But surely our ultimate goal should be that the, the systems that we're part of are, are resilient themselves. And that often means not just that the individual nodes behave in ways that have adapted, but the way the system functions, whether that's an international system of trade or whatever it is, but that the system itself is resilient. And that's a different framing and it means different things and has different implications for how we, how we do and how we conceive and how we research adaptation. So systemic resilience should be a goal as well. So I'm going to move right on to the second question, which is about what the barriers are for adaptation. And if you are out there in the audience in the room, or if you are watching this online, you are not off the hook. We're going to ask this to the panel, but we also want to get your insights on this. So um, with any electronic luck, there is going to be a Mentimeter uh, code up there, and you can weigh in on your thoughts about what the barriers are. Who would like to start off talking about the barriers that we need to think about? Youssef, you want to start again? Um, from my perspective, the, the biggest barrier is short-termism. And I think that comes a lot from our economic practice. I mean, look at how, how we do cost-benefit analysis. You have a, a discount rate that discounts future costs and benefits, working sort of against intergenerational equity. So we're always um, implicitly um, prioritizing actions that have um, sort of short-term outlooks. And with adaptation, you don't want that. It works also against the ecosystem-based um, adaptation. So um, I see this as a, as a systemic failure in our current modalities in dealing with the long-term problem, because both our economic approaches and business decision-making, and perhaps some um, political uh, angle to that, promote uh, or go against thinking long term, despite what we might be saying, um, but it really doesn't work that way. Then the second thing is um, um, the cognitive biases that um, are preventing the general public from seeing the seriousness of the problem as it really is. 
So whenever um, any um, uh, crisis comes along, economic or otherwise, usually climate action is the first uh, set of actions that suffers. Um, simply because uh, they woke up today and found that it looks exactly like yesterday and they know they wake up tomorrow, it looks like today. So there's no sense of urgency there. It's like the story of the frog being thrown in the boiling water. And um, when you see something like COVID, you know, you see the impacts right away. Everyone wants action. Everyone wants to invest. Unfortunately, adaptation and climate change action in general does not enjoy that type of um, urgent mindset. So that's another challenge we're facing. Third, I think, is um, a global outlook. Um, so Magnus mentioned that uh, we, we tend to do adaptation in, in sort of little nodes, but um, we're not really thinking holistically. So yes, you could have one country adapting at the expense of its neighbors, and uh, we know that SEI has a project on that and on transboundary impacts, but, um, but global adaptation is not an aggregation of adaptation in individual countries. These are two different animals. And we tend to just think in these local terms. And um, I mean, one country could decide to adapt. It has a food insecurity problem, so it can destroy its forests to convert them into farmland, and they're very happy. But what has that done to adaptation globally? So I think this outlook, looking at the different levels and making sure that we are becoming resilient at all these different levels, is uh, one of the barriers that we have now. Now it's just done at national level. Um, so, uh, so yeah, these are my three barriers. Yeah, and anyone else want to list some barriers that he didn't mention? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so um, those are really, really high level and, and I can just bring it down to sort of the place-based nature thing. So talking to implementers of, of nature-based solutions for adaptation in the UK, what they tell us is that one critical barrier is um, lack of or limited access to information about what works and what doesn't work when it comes to interventions in the landscape, both what works and what doesn't work in terms of ways of financing projects, but also in terms of effectiveness and cost effectiveness. There seems to be you know, problems accessing the most relevant information, partly because of the place-based nature written partly because a lot of that information is tucked away in journals and isn't accessible enough. But then also a challenge around, you know, sharing best practice. I mean, many communities around the world have been dealing with variability and have a great deal of sort of on the ground, you know, understanding of how to adapt and others that, that have perhaps historically been in more stable, um, less variable climates are really struggling. And so I think, you know, there are, you know, and that's where some technology can come in, in terms of like enhancing sharing of, of best practice in a rapidly warming world. So I think that's often identified in the conversations with practitioners um, from from my perspective or the perspective of the Nature-Based Solutions Initiative and the work we've done on this in Oxford was that lack of access to information with critically important. Um, building on what you've, I mean, what you've already said, I mean, that whole mismatch between the whole systems thinking approach and integration, which is all sort of, you know, so we're now talking about systems of systems of systems thinking when it, when it comes to trying to tackle adaptation. And that all sounds great um, from a sort of scientific point of view and a philosophical point of view, and it kind of resonates and it's coming up in all sorts of conversations across multiple sectors. But again, how does that land with very siloed governance? And obviously we've been talking about, you know, siloed research. Research is becoming more interdisciplinary in places and that's fantastic. But then, as you say, Lisa, how does that then translate into extraordinarily siloed policy um, structures in most, if not all, governments around the world and, and big organisations and so forth? So that, that's really, really challenging. And then the third piece um, is, of course, finance, uh, insufficient finance, but, but sort of beyond lack of a sufficient finance, um, you know, it's like ensuring that the right sort of finance gets to the right people and the projects that need it most. And there are many examples of you know, really um, not maladaptive investments in our landscapes because there's been too much money or it's been money that's been targeting one particular problem, which isn't actually the problem that the local communities face. So those are my three. Thanks. It's interesting what you say and also what's coming up. It's awkwardly behind you. Um, but it's interesting, finance comes up a lot, other things related to economics, capitalism, and politics, but there are like, uh, there's a lot of things that are connected up there. Just, Lisa, is there anything you'd like to say? It's difficult for the panelists to see, but. Yeah, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> But um, yeah, well, I wouldn't add, I mean, I think just to pick up on what I said at the beginning, I think the challenge is really, <laughs> The main barrier is that we're looking for adaptation within these climate change 
projects or programs and we're narrowing our activities in this very kind of in this siloed way. I mean, the, the UNFCCC and, you know, anything that gets labeled um, adaptation and resilience. And I think actually a lot of adaptation could happen outside, it, I mean, outside those labels, outside. And, and in fact, um, I mean, you know, I, well, I will come back, of course, always to the, you know, other kinds of development and particularly activities that will help to address the drivers of vulnerability. And that's not what, what the adaptation that we're seeing implemented is doing. And so I think, you know, we need to probably, a barrier is the lack of wide, broader thinking or the more holistic thinking that allows us to kind of say, oh, maybe, uh, maybe this is, you know, it doesn't have to be called climate change and actually it's contributing to adaptation in some way. Uh, but because we have this UNSCC process and it's sort of everything has to be tagged and the, the way that the financing works and the, the, the funds and so on, it, 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 it limits us very much to this thinking around climate change. Um, and I think that that has created, I mean, I would say that one of the biggest problems is that we then have we, we must see it as climate change, otherwise it's not doing something for adaptation to climate change. But actually, there's a lot of other activities that are also probably helping build resilience. We just don't consider those as part of the sort of the suite of adaptation activities. Yusuf may have something to say about that, but I'll turn to my colleagues first. Magnus, would you like to weigh in? Yeah, thanks. Um, echoing what Natalie said, I think there's a escalating complexity both in adaptation research itself when we start to bring in systemic systems of systems and, and cross-border risks and that we're very we, we struggle with that concept as we work on such risks like this is making the job of adaptation harder for our target audience by complexifying the problem um, and at the same time that's the real world it's an interconnected uh, complex world but so the, the science in AR6 was, was very clear in saying adaptation is more complex than we thought it was. There are these cascading compound complex risks and that makes adaptation a, more challenge, a bigger challenge. So the knowledge is, is making the job more complex. And meanwhile, decision makers are facing essentially a world of repeat crises that are related to climate change, but they go beyond climate change. So landing a message that's inc increasingly complex to a group of decision makers that are dealing with increasingly complex crises is a huge barrier. Um, that's a sort of research challenge. Uh, on the practice of adaptation, um, I think a major barrier is the insufficient and unclear risk ownership around adaptation. And um, we've seen, we've traced the history of adaptation from being framed as an environmental concern essentially governed and most NAPs are, are led by environment ministries and there are lots of good reasons for that but adaptation needs to be done and owned beyond the environment ministry and that's a huge challenge and um, it's something that I think a lot of countries are struggling with um, particularly as they embrace the complexity of adaptation who owns these specific risks that risk that we risk identify and research and it's not a problem that anyone has solved well and I think it plays into a bigger challenge within government, which is how to build resilience and manage risk strategically within the government architecture, the silos that Lisa spoke about. And a number of governments are struggling with, with non-climate risks as well, whether that's cyber, terrorism, supply chain resilience, or health pandemics. And I think there's a strong case for uh, governments to create new areas ministries even, ministries of resilience is an idea that, that we've started to discuss that goes beyond climate change but deals with these external, often external, strategic risks in um, centres of decision making and power that are beyond the environment ministry. Sikena, I'll give you the last word. Um, okay, just maybe to go back to the point about um, how we reaching this goal of adaptation, how are we reducing vulnerability, understanding the drivers of vulnerability and risk and increasing adaptive capacity. I think we still have a major fundamental problem with um, power still being held in, in global north institutions when it comes to project design and implementation and conception. And there are efforts now, I think, to, to change that. But 
overall, that's still a major issue. And I think there is no way we can, I mean, when we talk about structural change, that is one of the major structural changes that needs to happen on a fundamental level by donors and uh, by institutions like ourselves as well. So um, I think that's the one thing. The other thing is uh, around, um, as Natalie uh, alluded to, information and knowledge management. So I would obviously mention that, um, coordinating We Adapt with an amazing team at SCI and around the world. But I think we don't have enough understanding about what works and what doesn't work already. There is already so much we can learn from what's, what's taken place. There is a lot of replication and redundancy in, in the work that new work that's happening. And part of the reason for this is, is again, the siloing of information, but also a lack of sharing knowledge. And um, I think as we alluded to, you know, it, we're not saying, you know, this is not about like tools of the solution. There is no silver bullet there, but, you know, technology's moved on. There's so much more that we can harness now that we couldn't before 20 years ago. And, um, you know, we should, we should make the most of that and really try and um, use it to our advantage. And yeah, there's a lot of work going on around that, which we can talk about more later. I think the panelists have made really clear that these I issues are, are very interconnected. And we'll, we'll move to our last question. And again, I'm going to ask all of you who are watching this either in the room or um, on the streaming to weigh in as well as we talk, we get to the heart of the matter, which is how to speed up and scale up or how to progress. Um, in terms of adaptation, so please do weigh in on that. And um, uh, who would who would like to start? I um, I don't feel we need to keep to a strict order or anything. I'd love to hear you all debate <laughs> debate what needs to be done. I I assume people are going to have some different views. Yeah, go ahead. You're looking at me. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I think one of the things that's important um, in, in the IPCC Working Group 2 report, um, we were quite clear that there the, you know, the, as I said earlier, that limits to adaptation are also global warming levels and that as the temperature increases, we won't be able to adapt as well. Uh, so we have to start adapting. And I think if talk, talk, talking about speed up, so clearly we have to speed up. But on the other hand, um, a lot of research is showing that we are adaptation isn't effective. Adaptation is um, actually making people more vulnerable, and partly that's because the kind of adaptation that is implemented isn't really addressing drivers of vulnerability. It's not considering local context. It's not involving local people. It is. It's. It's very top down, and um, and it is sort of uh, the outcomes are validated by agendas that are set by the donors and and sort of other actors in the global north, and and so. Um, that means that we have to be much more um, strategic, much more careful and, and considerate in the way that we plan adaptation projects. But everybody's looking out there. <laughs> um, I feel like I'm missing out. Um, and, and so how to, how to kind of, how do we deal with this that we have on the one hand, we need to speed up and we need to move really quickly. But on the other hand, we actually, every adaptation project needs to be much more um, carefully planned and must, sort of the consultation pro consultatory process has to be very long and how do we do that in order to avoid maladaptation in order to make make p things worse and throw away money or whatever you want to kind of prioritize is the issue so I think that's a big challenge and I don't really know uh, how we can overcome that but I think that you know maybe maybe the pressure to speed up we need to be cautious that we're not just falling into these traps of reproducing maladaptation projects. Uh, may maybe you should speak next because I see that uh, the Ministry of Resilience is leading the way in our <laughs> mentee exercise. Um, when I started working on adaptation about 15 years ago, I had a colleague who disparagingly used to say, adaptation, that's just green roofs or guns. And I, as well as being amusing, it was a challenge to sort of define what is in the space between green roofs and guns. And there's nothing wrong with green roofs, um, but it's, adaptation is more strategic than hyper-localized small technology fix projects. But it's also less fatalistic than preparing for the apocalypse and 
arming yourself to the teeth to solve the problem. But fatalism and, and, and doomsday planning often results in actors becoming much more narrowly self-interested. So I think the solution lies somewhere in defining, um, creating a narrative for adaptation existing between green roofs and guns. And we still have space for a very multilateral approach to adaptation. I'm most interested in this, the global scale of adaptation and cross-border effects of adaptation and risk. And we still have the architecture that can deliver us a multilateral um, adaptation uh, set of solutions um, based on principles of interdependence and solidarity. The Paris Agreement does lay that out and, and sets the space for a vision of global adaptation. And despite very real threats to the multilateral order that we have experienced in the last few years, we still have a system of international law and multilateral cooperation which we need to achieve that systemic resilience. So I very much agree with Lisa that we shouldn't go too hard and too quick on a direction of adaptation that might not work and might be defined uh, within paradigms that are counterproductive. We have a lot of scope for maladaptation. But part of what we need to, um, to upscale our ambition on adaptation is a narrative that explains in a more persuasive way why we need to adapt and why we need to adapt together particularly. And unfortunately, the, the, the narratives we've had until now haven't really worked. The, the level of investment, both politically and financially, in adaptation is woefully insufficient. So we need to add to the narratives of, of equity and historical responsibility, which are extremely valid. And some of that requires an appeal to self-interest, that if we invest in adaptation overseas, it can have positive uh, paybacks. Um, that's got a dangerous dark side to it, which is that we securitize and strategize adaptation, and we should be well aware of that. But on the other hand, we do need new narratives about why adaptation needs to move up the political agenda and why it's worthy of more investment. And I think this narrative of interdependence and of adaptation in one place delivering shared benefits, systemic benefits even, is something that we need to um, get right. Thank you. Yeah, I'm resisting the temptation to look behind to find out what you all think and people online think as well. We spoke before about um, uh, barriers in terms of finance and governance. On the governance side, we clearly need Ministry of Resilience. We also need departments of resilience across uh, businesses as well. So I, I agree. I think that will go a long way to helping. But I want to speak a bit about finance because one in terms of an opportunity and another in terms of the elephant in the room and all these discussions about sustainable development. And I'll start with the opportunity. I mean, there's a huge funding gap for adaptation that needs to be plugged on the one hand. On the other hand, we're seeing vast amounts of uh, funding being generated through the voluntary carbon offset market, which is a wild, unregulated West at the moment. Huge amounts of funding potentially there. If we can somehow, through proliferation of really robust, high-integrity boundary organisations, ensure that that finance that is coming from the mitigation side of things through this unstoppable juggernaut, carbon juggernaut, we can somehow channel that to the projects and the people that need it most to support all those people all those farmers all those communities all over the world who are getting on with adaptation right here and now whether it's floating gardens in bangladesh or farmers in somerset that are just doing salt marsh restoration because it's stopping their crops becoming flooded if we can get that all that finance to those local communities who are doing adaptation you know uh, i think there's a real opportunity there to plug that gap but we need to do it really carefully and we need to make sure it gets to the and can you know empower local communities and indigenous peoples to do what they've done for a long time. The elephant of, in the room, of course, is uh, GDP, isn't it, and economic growth. You know, the subsidization of the destruction, the ongoing destruction of the natural ecosystems on which we all depend, but where dependency is particularly high across uh, low and lower income countries across the tropics. All of us depend on nature, even more so in those regions 
if we can somehow, you know, trillions are invested every year that, that contribute to the, um, that compromise our resilience via their harmful impacts, yes, in increasing climate warming, but also in causing degradation of those ecosystems, degradation of our, of our landscapes. That's the big elephant in the room. We need to fix that. And if we can stop talking about economic growth and start talking about where well, many are, or many of you are already talking about growth in well-being and that being the target, then I think many of these problems could be solved. So I just wanted to mention Those things that. are up there. You'll be happy to know. <laughs> I see, I see various <laughs> references. Sukaino, what minutes. are your thoughts on this? <laughs> so I guess uh, just linking to the first point I made, you know, um, scaling up and speeding up is about is still for me mostly most uh, sort of fundamentally about whose knowledge counts and if we're thinking about how to do this quickly but at the same time not sort of rush into things um i think there is a huge tension there and but at the end of the day i think we have to develop these knowledge co-production processes co-develop knowledge together with you know a range of people around the table um, researchers, decision makers, climate scientists, practitioners, civil society organizations on the one hand, but then on the other hand, between ourselves as academics and scientists, between the different disciplines. And I think, you know, all of that is really hard to do. So how we see it, how we do that quickly, I, I'm not really sure, but um, I think we need to build capacity for how to do that. There are, there are ways to do this and they do take a lot of time and a lot of resources, but I think doing that well, co-producing knowledge well, um, is possible and it is really the only way to get to well-designed interventions. And we need to build the capacity of more people to carry out those processes. So moving away from products and models and tools and moving towards processes that allow people to do that sort of knowledge co-production together. Um, and that links to my point about, you know, shifting the power from the global north to the global south institutions, because they are the ones who should be leading those processes. Um, and then lastly, probably I just would point to, um, again, the point about evaluating and learning from what's already taken place. And how do we share knowledge on that more effectively that people are sort of taking on board in the, in the design of new interventions? And I think there's a lot of, um, I know Yusuf was going to touch on this aspect of AI, but around technology, there is a lot of really exciting work going on that would allow us to better describe the um, adaptation actions we are taking that, you know, have both successes and failures so that others can learn from them quickly. And that's, if that's what we need to do right now, I think we shouldn't be afraid of tapping into those technologies. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, um, maybe I start with, with the change of, of narrative. Um, I mean, this, is, this year is the 20th anniversary of, um, of, of SEI here, and it's the 21st anniversary of the creation of the IPCC Adaptation Definition, co-authored by Richard. Um, it's also the 50th anniversary of the Stockholm Declaration, the Stockholm Principles, and if you read them, you'll find they pretty much uh, represent an agreement a collective agreement of, of the world to do stuff that we're still calling for today. Um, I also look at the Paris Agreement. Um, it's been around for, what, seven years almost. And um, since then, we've poured four trillion dollars, four trillion additional dollars into fossil fuels. So there's something wrong with the narrative. And um, the doom and gloom story doesn't work. I mean, you've had, you've had this message, smoking kills on, on, on cigarette boxes for decades. It's not what got people to, to stop smoking. And similarly, the story of your own, you're all going to die, so you need to adapt doesn't work either. Um, and I'm wondering if, if um, it's more effective to move to a positive narrative where, you know, if you do this right, um, you will reach a state of resilience that entails all these good things in your lives in the future. And that, that would require a, a movement away from a problem slash solution mentality towards one of creative design of the future. 
we're so bogged down with uh, with the problem and solving it, and 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 it's it's grounding us in yesterday, not in tomorrow. And so um, this goes hand in hand with increasing awareness of the phase we're in. Uh, I think Magnus said we we were in an environmental phase. We were looking at um, climate change from the perspective of its being an environmental issue. We moved towards seeing it as a developmental issue in the 2000s, starting with the MDGs, and we started trying to quantify everything. Um, now, since 2018, we've entered into that existential phase. But policy hasn't caught up with that. We're still using the same tools, economic and otherwise, um, to figure out actions in a phase where this doesn't work. How do you quantify human existence? How do you quantify the the the, the persistence of the human race. Um, and we're still looking at this context where we're trying to make the business case um, for adaptation. Of course, what suffers is nature, because you have a context where um, a dead tree can be considered to be more valuable than a live tree. And this is all stuff that needs to change. So changing the narrative towards that new phase, which includes both awareness of the existential nature of, um, of, of climate change, but also the positive aspects of a transformation towards a resilient world. Not necessarily resilient only to climate change, but generically resilient. And, and with it comes an adjustment of our assessment methodologies using also um, frontier technologies. And the, there's already a, a lot of um, startups using AI for risk assessment, and they're, um, they're, they're selling their, their outcomes to, to cities, as far as I know at this point, and they're working very well. And, um, and so I think um, this change in, in worldview, change in mindset, um, not towards an unprecedented mental state, it's actually what already exists in indigenous communities, the principles of connectivity, collectivity, intergenerational equity, and transforming our modernizing towards indigenous values, basically. Um, doesn't mean you have, to, you have to adopt the practices and knowledge, but the actual underlying principles and values as applied to modern life, reforming humanity's relationship with nature, uh, realizing the, 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 the importance of our natural support system to our existence, not as, as a factor of production. I mean, this is what got us into this mess to start with. Um, and perhaps looking at climate change not just as a standalone problem, but as one of many symptoms we've been seeing all the way from acid rain to ozone depletion, species extinction, etc., and now pandemics. You can keep trying to solve each of them separately, but then you'll have something else coming up uh, a decade from now, and it's like we're, we're playing catch-up. So what's that fundamental paradigm shift that we need to adopt in order to accelerate? So I didn't start by saying, you know, pour more money or do this, because you can accelerate motion in the wrong direction, and then you end up somewhere where you shouldn't be. <coughs> and so we need to align our direction first. Also align action with intent. I mean, I gave you a couple of examples where this is not happening. And, um, and revising our post-industrial revolution narrative towards well-being of humanity collectively, not just individually. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, lots of thought-provoking stuff there. I especially um, like the idea that we could speed up in the wrong direction. You know, Seneca says, if you don't know where you're going, no wind is favorable. Um, and also the whole idea of grounding um, our approaches in thinking about tomorrow rather than yesterday that perfectly sets us up for our intergenerational chat where we are going to be talking about people who know about all these processes and have worked their careers in it and also up and young young up and coming people who I'm sure are thinking about tomorrow. So I'm going to use this opportunity to thank our panelists here and we do a little choreography and switch things up. I'm so glad to hear um, the chatter, the excitement. It was a really stimulating panel. Um, uh, but now, now we're going to move on. Um, and I'm going to invite you. It's not really a fireside chat. I'm going to invite you to join us around a campfire, uh, a campfire with uh, an intergenerational theme. Um, I'm going to introduce the panelists briefly and say a few words. And then we're just going to kick off. And it, I hope that we're going to have a conversation 
rather than have too many sort of, I'd like to hear what you think in us. So uh, do feel free just to interject when you want to. But I'll, let me introduce you to everybody here. So um, Innes, uh, at the far right, Innes uh, is uh, a, a research associate at SCI, uh, based here in Oxford. Uh, we then have George. Uh, George works uh, at the UK Youth Climate Coalition of volunteers there. He's the press officer. Um, then we also have Aram. Aram is uh, working at the World Bank uh, and is a specialist in climate adaptation. And then Richard here, uh, closest to me, uh, is a senior research fellow at SEI. Really grateful that you've joined us here today for our campfire, around our campfire. Um, Yusuf mentioned um, that this year is not only the 20th anniversary of SE Oxford, but it's also the 50th anniversary of the Stockholm Declaration. Looked back at the Stockholm Declaration. How many mentions of the word adaptation do you think there are? None. Good. <laughs> Very good. Even the word adapt doesn't appear in it at all. But funnily enough, there are a couple of principles that talk about the need for rational planning, about thinking about you know, making sure that economic development isn't putting pressure on natural systems. There's all sorts of stuff in there that's hugely relevant today. today. Earlier this year, um, there was a big conference, UN conference, Stockholm Plus 50. Um, and for that conference, uh, SEI put forward a, a scientific report, but also helped to facilitate um, uh, a report called Charting a Youth Vision for a Just and Sustainable Future. So the, uh, we've actually heard a little bit quite recently from uh, younger people, uh, younger scholars, about what their vision is. And surprisingly enough, scaling adaptation was one of the key policy recommendations they come up with. And I'm sure we're going to explore that in a little bit more detail right now. I'm going to kick off with a question and I'm going to point it to, first of all, to Innes. And it's a very simple question. Uh, in what ways is adaptation an intergenerational issue? That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> um, why is it an intergenerational issue? Well, climate change is the result of one, two centuries of emitting greenhouse gases. Um, and we've known for long enough that we could have avoided the situation in which we are right now if we had acted fast enough and in a concerted way. But being where we are, the young generation is the one that is facing and will keep facing the threats, the consequences of climate change. Um, and that is why today they are so inv involved in climate action. That's why they are at the forefront. And that's why they are the ones I feel leading some of the big changes in, in how the narrative evolves. Um, and that's why I think they're here to stay. Richard, do you want to just elaborate a little bit on, on the, the intergenerational aspects of adaptations we see it now? Sure, yeah, and I think when you, when you talk about climate risk and about adaptation and about you know, the differences between the generations, often it's the elderly that are mentioned as those that are particularly vulnerable and those that need support. And the heat waves in, in, in Paris in 2003 were a very clear example of how the elderly were particularly affected. And, and, and it's interesting how adaptation has also very much become a priority for the younger generation. I think I can say there's the only old person here at the panel. Um, <laughs> um, and and, and it's, it's, maybe it's not because young people are particularly vulnerable in the same way as the elderly are, but you have that incredibly strong sense of justice. You can build a movement. And it's really interesting to see how adaptation over the past, say, five years or so, has become very much an issue of, of social and climate justice. Uh, I think that that is something that the younger generation has brought in. That's not something that we've talked or thought about an awful lot in the IPCC reports that I've been involved with. We didn't really talk much about climate justice or about justice in the context of adaptation. That's something that has come up with the new generation, and it's got it. It has not only added a dimension that is interesting from an academic point of view, it has added a dimension that can actually give extra momentum to adaptation action. 
one, one of the things that came up in the Youth Vision report uh, published earlier this year um, was the, the need for increased agency. Um, and I want to turn to, to George, actually, and I'll ask George a little bit about whether, you know, could you give us some examples or just reflect on the role of, of young people and, and the youth climate movement in adaptation and in scaling adaptation? What agency are you looking for? Yeah. What do you have? Yeah, sure. I noticed um, on the board above me, lots of people wrote in response to the questions we had before that adaptation initiatives need to be targeted more at local people. Um, and I think there's always a bit of a question from the youth movement about who who constitutes local people. Um, and we tend to argue that, that, you know, a lot of local people targeted on adaptation initiatives, especially in the global south, should be the young, those who are, have the ideas, those that are willing to experiment and imagine what a good future can be. Um, and so rarely are young people around the world given the tools genuinely to do that. Um, you know, we're very fortunate that Ines and myself can be on a panel like this um, today in a way that might not have been thought about maybe 10 years ago. But um, there's a number of organizations that the UK Youth Climate Coalition works with um, that don't really, you know, have the kind of tokenistic inclusion mm. in these kind of discussions, but don't actually have the tools, um, you know, given to them to act. So a good example of this is um, an organization called Green African Youth Organization, GAIO, that exists in Ghana. Um, and we have been on various panels with them and events over the past year. Um, they run a program called Water uh, Adaptation for Water, um, where they go around, like lots of young people around Ghana who live in um, arid communities that are looking to, to drill boreholes for agriculture and also for, for nutrition. Um, and they, this is a kind of distributed network of young people that are contacting each other using social media. Um, they have projects ready to go where there are communities that will benefit from these interventions, um, but they're not given the finance to do that. It's very piecemeal. They go, go to conferences and talk about the one borehole that they've drilled. Um, but then when they ask for more fi finance, they're told you don't have a bank account. You don't have collateral to put down against any sort of loan. You don't have the ability to pay back a market rate loan. Um, there's no trust, basically, um, to, to give young people the tools to do what, what we feel like we want to do. Um, so I think that's a, that is the problem. When you think about who are local people, who are the young people looking to, to try and do something, um, it's, it's a bit of a, I guess, a trust-based problem to some extent. Oh, thanks, George. Um, Aram. Um, for, I mean, feel free to to come in on on how the how you and, and and perhaps your colleagues at the World Bank see adaptation potentially through an intergenerational lens, but also perhaps also reflecting a little bit on what George said about how uh, organisations like the World Bank can really support these uh, initiatives and the entrepreneurial spirit of, of of youth movements to actually get to scale, so they're not stuck with just the one ball. I don't represent the bank here. <laughs> First point of clarification. I was led by the topic, the future of adaptation. It had me flowing from Burundi all the way here. No, no, it's, it's great. I'll reflect on that in a minute. But first, I want to acknowledge how nice it is to really see all these. All these, I guess now, we're the oldies, huh? 20 years on. Huh? Yourself. So, yes, there you go. So, okay, now others. Really good to see everybody, as well as new colleagues. Listen, I agree with Richard that we hadn't anticipated the young folks coming in and taking the climate activism by storm. I still remember watching the young Swedish, I forget her name, a Nobel Prize uh, Greta. Uh, Greta, Greta Thunberg. And I was like, whoa, these, these, these young people will really make the difference. Huh? Whatever we haven't achieved, they will achieve it. I, I started, and I see you dating yourself makes us date ourselves as well. Eh? I started in adaptation 20 years back in the mangroves communities in coastal Senegal. Back then, we didn't call it NBS. It was just replanting mangroves to, to fight, <laughs> to fight sea, coastal, sea, sea level rise or coastal uh, inclusion of sea salt waters. But it's interesting, 20 years on, to reflect on how we enable you. That's how I would like to interpret the question. I think a challenge to all of us is we need to at least pass on what has worked. I think we haven't done that properly. Uh, it's hard to have a definitive statement on what is effective adaptation, but after 20 years, so we really need to get to a place where we have that. 
And I work at the bank and as a development practitioner, I get that question every day. Great, we want to fund adaptation at scale. What is good adaptation? So to me, it's a defeat of our community that we still can't point them to a single place yeah. where we say, oh, you want examples of good adaptation? That's where you go to get it. So we adapt, of course, great job. But I think we really do need to agree am among ourselves. This is where you go to see what has worked. Time-tested, ground-proven, effective adaptation in climate-smart agriculture, in water resource management, in coastal resilience. This has been tried over the past 20 years, and it's worked. So why don't you give it a shot and scale that up? So I think that's one challenge to, to this side of the room, <laughs> that we really should get to that place, and hopefully pretty soon. And I'm not saying, and I'm looking at Lisa here, that we should have an adaptation metric. I do agree that's futile. But I do think we do agree that there are good adaptation practices in design, co-production, in actual effective ground impacts. So let's put that someplace. So I think that's the first thing I'd like to say. And hopefully that offers you a way forward as you, as you do the good work that you have ahead of you. I think the second challenge now to your side of the room is uh, how do you not just stay an adaptation specialist? I think the times have changed. You work in the bank, the question is not, oh, climate matters. The question is, how do we achieve development with climate in mind? I think we're really in a different place than we were a few, two decades back. And your value added at the table, where you have your health specialist, where you have your, you name it, education specialist, and among all these multiple competing priorities of development, you've got to make the case that this is how you do good development, bearing in mind current and future climate risks. And we've talked earlier in the panel about the barriers. Uh, climate information is still quite uncertain. We don't know the localized. There's a million stuff. But I think around that table, you still, do, you still have to make that very articulate. And Magnus, I loved how you said it earlier. A very articulate case for why it is that we will not achieve development impacts if climate adaptation is not done, is not done well, and is not done effectively and at scale. That's the challenge. I have some ideas. We'll talk to the, about that. <laughs> I'll step people now, thanks. But, but how, how can we make successes more visible, right? I mean, if something fails, then it's, it's headline news. But you'll never see a headline that says 50,000 people did not drown in a flood. <laughs> or, you know, there's no famine because we actually did this really well. Um, that, that is a challenge, isn't it? Because we, we keep being being you know and, and of course we are doing things wrong um and we should learn from that but it's much easier to um to recognize the mistakes than it is to recognize the successes mm -hmm. and and i'm i'm just like you know hoping that wise people like yusuf can give an alternative to the metrics because you're saying like you know there's a problem with the metrics but you know what what else is there and when we say that adaptation is linked to or similar to or, or connected to development you know when we when we measure development whether that's in in gdp or, or in a human development index or whatever we're not just counting the projects that were funded as development projects right we have a much broader understanding of development and somehow we can take stock of that but when we try to take stock of adaptation, we're just looking at what the Green Climate Fund and the Adaptation Fund and the individual donors and the World Bank fund as adaptation projects, as if there's no adaptation happening outside of these projects. And I think that's what Lisa's point was as well. Um, uh, there is, and it's not just a matter of definition, it's a matter of um, understanding how you effectively reduce risk, mm -hmm. but also understanding how you avoid increasing risk, because I think that's that's still happening way too much as well. Anyway, I'll, I'll just leave it there for now. <laughs> yeah, if I can follow up on that, um, how we measure success in getting resilient in a resilient world, um, I think you're right to think that adaptation needs to go beyond um, the silo in which it currently is, and that was heavily discussed in the previous um, panel. Um, to me, what's at the core of it is something that actually the youth movement is um, claiming again and again and again, it's people before profit. And when I say people before profit, it means that um, when we're 
uh, assessing what works or what doesn't, um, maybe we need to change the perspective and ask the people whether they are happier, whether they feel like they have uh, more opportunities to achieve personal or collective goals, whether they feel um, like they have a purpose in life, um, get maybe more subjective qualitative measures in, in, in how we do science, how we measure whether adaptation works or not. Um, that's linked to, I think it was Lisa who said that we need more social sciences in, in adaptation. Um, and, and in the end, that, that, that links to the power dynamics. It, it means stopping imposing um, the, the, the donors um, ways of, of measuring or of establishing programs and objectives, but listening to what the people on the ground have to say, uh, what their priorities are, um, and what type of action they want to implement. And, and we can learn a lot from the field of development, for instance, which has uh, a lot more experience in, in measuring what works or not. Um, I believe that cash transfers have been proven as an option that works surprisingly well because it gives the people on the ground the direct opportunity to use it as they wish um, the money and, and, and that could be a way to implement more initiatives um, at the local level to fight droughts, to fight famine, to fight poverty and in the end it's, yeah, it is a holistic thinking that adaptation is about making humans and beings in general, including our environment, um, in mo more in harmony and, and, and happier. Oh, was it the end of my time? <laughs> Someone has <laughs> the you. answer. Someone has the answer. Um, in this thing, I, I want to pick up actually something for, came from the panel that we've just had that you've now mentioned around metrics. Natalie was talking about, well, part of the elephant in the, in the room in terms of barriers, it's GDP. It's how do we measure development? So I'm going to turn to Aram actually straight away and say, you talked about adaptation, you know, people at the, at the World Bank, your colleagues, they talk about, they don't talk about adaptation, they talk about, you know, delivery mechanisms, whether that's education or other things. But ultimately, I want to hear a little bit about how you take up the challenge from the, the, the previous panel around, well, if we measure development in terms of GDP, then we're going to get really stuck and end up putting in place some barriers to, to adaptation. What's the saying? What cannot be measured? Help me out here. Cannot be managed. Yeah. So I think that's where the obsession with measuring and having a, an adaptation equivalent to the mitigation carbon ton metric comes from. But I think we've made the case that it's context specific, it's locality specific, and good adaptation is look locally locally measured. But we still haven't shown what to do with it. That's where we stuck. We said, okay, there won't be an adaptation metric, but then we still haven't shown, okay, this is still in the development planning process, how you know that you have achieved climate resilient development in subjective qualitative terms. So I think that's, that's, that's the challenge from, from before. We've, we've just got to show what it looks like. Mm in practice in different localities. So I, I hope that answers that, that first question. But I'm still stuck on what Richard was asking. How do you also show the good averted, <laughs> averted losses? Uh, Youssef started, I think, responding to that question earlier by saying, let's perhaps draw more on the positive narratives. Hmm? In, in, in countries where we don't have ministries of resilience, but where now it's ministries of finance that are talking about the, the macro criticality of climate change. I think that's success. When it's seen in a given country that you cannot develop properly without addressing climate risk, those are success stories. Mm -hmm. And when we start understanding most importantly, the opportunities that also climate change poses by ensuring that early warning today averts losses in the future. So I think the narrative globally is shifting in that direction. It needs to be celebrated. But again, the role of research here is to show the way. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we're reflecting back on 20 years, but looking ahead at the next 20 years, at 2030 and at 2040, mm -hmm. I really hope that we won't be having those same discussions about how we measure adaptation, but rather we'll be looking at how to do it better in FCV contexts. Mm -hmm. I flew in from Burundi, so we still don't know how fragility and adaptation are overlapping. I know great research is at the forefront of topics, topics of, of that nature. But I think we need to really now move on to those now new frontiers of understanding how effectively do we deliver and, and do adaptation. 
in, for example, FCV context. It's just one example. I'm sure there's many more from the audience. Mm. Thanks, yeah. Um I was think I was just going to say that in quite quite a lot of um, you know youth frustration, maybe it's sometimes a little bit through ignorance <laughs> of the adaptation and just general climate response area is that you hear these discussions about micromanagement and um, you know specific metrics, and it it all, it all seems so complicated when you look at it from a policy level. But from from the perspective of like youth that, that we work with, the only thing that matters to them is they've learned about climate change for the first time in school and they're terrified for their future. Um, and they take a, you know, it only takes 30 seconds to look at the adaptation gap report to know without looking at any specific metrics, how far off we are from meeting the challenge, I suppose. Um, and I guess obviously the question that we're trying to answer is what do you do with that? Um, I was trying to come up with experimental responses. I think, it's easy to forget how many people are left out of the conversation. Um, and that, you know, just to chuck in another example, there's an organization we work with um, that we've, we've been with on events with before in Uganda called Children's and Youth uh, Forum for Environment and Climate Change. Uh, and one of the biggest challenges they have is maintaining a network of their members because the internet access in rural Uganda is so poor. So they have lots of um, people that, that want to learn more about climate change and how they can they can act on it, how they can study the issue, how they can educate their local community, um, but they don't even have access to the basic resources to do that. Um, and ultimately that does come down to the question of the development challenge that I know we've talked about on the panel already. Um, but I think the headline there is is just a, a case of like, how do you, you know, how do you extend um, adaptation further t to more people just as a narrative and also how do you get anywhere near the finance necessary to bring people on board and I, I think one thing that we haven't talked about yet that I know Ines and I have done quite a lot of work on is a around loss and damage finance that came up on the screen a couple of times um, this is sometimes referred to as the third pillar um, alongside mitigation and adaptation um, and I guess for you know there's a about a thousand youth NGOs um, that are members of the UN official, the UNFCC youth um, well, kind of constituency, Yungo, that are all going to be going to COP27 in November. And they're going to be calling on governments to pledge loss and damage finance in the form of reparations from global north countries and towards the global south. Um, and the demand is very simple. Um, the global north needs to put more money towards um, financing Global South uh, climate action. Um, and we know that the response we're going to get is that's too complicated. What are you talking about? Um, so I guess the question is, is that is that not absurd in some respects? Obviously, it's, it's so much easier said than done. Um, but I like to think that if, if the world was run by, uh, you know, more young people, that that question would be a little bit easier of is the obvious justice answer not uh, a further redistribution of um, of wealth from the centers and towards the people that need it to adapt, uh, adapt to climate change. Um. And if I just may add to that, um, the person who should have been sitting at my spot is uh, Inessa Grace, Grace, who um, is one of the leader of the youth movement for loss and damage. She is the director and co-founder of um, the Lots and Damage Youth Coalition. And uh, yeah, she was invited to speak here tonight to represent the young generation um, that acts and thinks about what goes beyond adaptation. Um, she couldn't come because she didn't get her visa, other justice issues, but yeah. Um, I'm gonna have a challenge one for each, if you like, side of the panel. Not that we want to be dividing, we want to be building bridges, but I'm going to start off with the challenge to Aram and Richard. I remember in 2019, very vividly, watching Greta Thunberg say over and over again, shame on you. How is the senior generation going to avoid a speech of exactly the same type around adaptation, where the youth are saying, shame on you. What do you need to do? Yes, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
we we start saying that you know we're 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 empowering giving an awful lot of agency to the youth generation now so you know i hope we're, it's not going to be the old people going to say shame on you no <laughs> um i you know i think that's it's it's really difficult because on the one hand i think like okay so i'm i i've been involved in the ipc for more than half my life right i don't think that's healthy but that's <laughs> where it is um and i'm just increasingly wondering you know are we just do we just keep reinventing the wheel you know whatever we came up with in the second assessment report the third assessment you know, all these special reports in between and so on it seems like we just keep saying the same thing but in slightly different ways like as you said like it used to be planting mangroves and now it's nature-based solutions um we're not really making much of a difference but why is it? Why are, are we as, as, as the older generation, as we as academics, are we as the adaptation community not making much of a difference? Um, is, would it be wise if the younger generation just like, you know, forget about these, you know, we'll just start from scratch? Maybe you should. Or maybe some of the wheels that we came up with were actually quite useful, um, but they're just being relabeled. I mean, Ines and I have an uh, ongoing conversation, very respectful but good conversation about whether loss and damage is basically just a relabeling of adaptation. You know, and when you say loss and damage finance, I say adaptation finance, we both agree that there should be a lot more money going to vulnerable people uh, to support, you know, minimizing, addressing and, and, and avoiding loss and damage. But, but is that... Is, is the focus on whether or not it's a third pillar or whether or not it's, you know, is that helpful for the people who stand to benefit from whatever it is that we are putting forward? And, and so I, I think, yes, I'm, I'm happy to take much of the blame. And I think <laughs> for better or worse, much of the discussion that we're having about adaptation in the IPCC and and, and, and also the UNFCC has somehow been influenced by work that I've been involved with. Um, but it was the best we could do at the time. And we're still doing the best we can. And if it's not enough, then let's come up with something better. I wouldn't say it was not enough. I think it was foundational. I think we did our part. That's the first layer. Now they build on the second layer and do much more. <laughs> so shame on us if we don't finance. To me, it comes down to that. I'm thinking of these women that we're supporting in the Collines of Burundi again, vividly. They need access to finance, not just to adapt, to develop. So I think it comes down to the fundamentals of equity, fairness, global solidarity, back to again something that Magnus raised earlier. We won't do it by research. We won't do it by, it just, I think it'll be all of you keeping to clamor and rebel and knocking on the doors of parliaments. That's what it'll take. In the global south, it'll take the young folks ri ri rising up as well, as we've seen uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the activist movements too, across Africa, for, for instance, saying climate matters and this is our future. There's no planet B. So I think that'll get a lot done. So I have a lot of optimism and hope that through the activism of, of the new generation, climate will become central to discussions and to, to and which will, it'll become macro critical as you say now in, in our development practice i'm not optimistic that it'll happen this year and <laughs> i'm i'm unplugged right now we'll see what comes out of cop 27 but we've been asking for loss and damage adaptation development finance for over 20 years now so i think it really is at, at the end of the day how much noise gets made and how much political will gets invested into sharing wealth and redistributing wealth and ensuring that at the end of the day, we are an interconnected world and that there is vested interest in preserving prosperity and well-being in all parts of the globe. Easier said than done. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Aram. Challenge to um, my... Do you want to start, George? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can do. I think I'm just thinking about I mean, the question that Richard asked, what is the difference between loss and damage and adaptation is a question that I asked myself, uh, I guess, this morning <laughs> in preparation for this event. And part of the part of the question, well, part of the answer to that, I think, is in 
in regard to how that how that finance is managed, I suppose. So with adaptation, we see, um, you know, each government you come up with your national adaptation plan, and then there's all these conditions around the funding. I guess with loss and damage, the argument goes that this is unavoidable um, loss caused by climate change, and therefore that should be uh, repaid in form of grants, um, kind of almost liability. Um, you know, we try not to frame it in too much of a legal context because then the US it gets very angry about it. Um, don't want any sort of liability on the shoulders of those who have omitted in the past. But I guess the point that NS made about direct cash transfer holds, you know, quite an important weight in this argument, I think, which is that um, there does need to be that, you know, if you're a youth organization that, that has a bank account, but no, uh, you know, no collateral to put behind a loan, then how are you expected to put forward any kind of adaptation action? Um, it's that same kind of barrier of, uh, you know, similarly, um, volunteer youth organizations don't have the capacity to fill out a hundred page uh, grant application form. Um, and I, I think when it comes to um, the question of why is it different, then the answer is perhaps it's a relabeling of the same thing with some slight differences around um, the way in which the finance is kind of operationalized. But ultimately, I guess it's a question of a movement rallying around a cause. Um, and, you know, it's if I was to make one prediction for between now and the end of the year, I think there's going to be a massive bust up at COP27 about loss and damage because the entire civil society uh, you know, group of progressives, i.e. youth organizations and organizations in the global south and some global south governments are going to be asking, where is the money? Um, we want it in the form of loss and damage, but they may also, you know, in a different world have said we want that in the form of adaptation. Um, and I think it's ultimately going to come down to, um, you know, a question of, is this uh, kind of wealth that is needed um, you know, where, you know, is it is it going to come in the form of trickle, kind of trickle down loans and insurance programs over time, or is there actually going to be some kind of finance facility um, kind of created? So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer. And I think to be fair, the people we need to convince are probably not the people necessarily in this room. Um, but that's the way it is. <laughs> yeah. Um I'm happy that we can talk about adaptation and loss and damage. <laughs> I get very excited about this, but. Um, Richard said that um, we could argue that loss and damage is a form of adaptation. I would argue the opposite in the UNFCCC context, just being a nerd about this right now. We talk about averting, minimizing and addressing loss and damage and, well, averting is basically mitigation, uh, minimizing is adaptation and addressing is what happens after. So I would argue that any climate action is loss and damage action. Um, but getting back on what you said about Greta Thunberg and the very famous shame on you, um, to me, the this shame is to be addressed. Um, the ones who should be ashamed are the ones who hold power, who have benefited, benefited from the system that we have in place that has caused climate change. The people who have caused it, who have accumulated wealth, who have accumulated power and who do whatever is in, in their power to maintain it because it is in their interests. Um, and all of us, to some extent, we're contributing to this and we, we have a certain responsibility to this. Um, but I assume, based on the many answers that I saw on the board, that most of you would be willing to give up a bit of that privilege for the common well-being. Um, but yeah, the, the shame on you is not directed to, towards researchers in particular, or you, Richard, or the old generation. <laughs> not the old generation. I, I think, and old. What does that mean? Um, we like we've all been young, and we've all been dreamers, and they've, you know, they've been the hippies, and they've been like each generation have um, their their own fights and want to change the system and our generation is facing the same issue. Um, the ones who should be ashamed are the ones who are keeping the money, the ones who are keeping the power, the ones who are um, 
emitting fossil fuel for their own benefit, extracting resource, extracting resources, and and exploiting humans, people, human humans for their own benefit, um, and who are imposing the pace of this transition and this transformation. Um, but what gives me a lot of hope is exactly the the, the fight and 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 the engagement of more and more people, young and old, who are saying that it's enough and time is time has come to 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 change this system and um i hope it will happen sooner rather than later but i have faith that it will happen because our system as it is capitalism is very good at evolving at adapting to 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 maintain itself but in the end it's also distracting itself so we don't have another t opportunity and, and and another choice then to change <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what I'll say here is that I'm enthused. We are still all dreamers. There's a bridge across the generations. Huh? We're not that old. Yes. No, I, um, maybe just one, one thing that is, um, I, well, I don't know if this is news at all, but it's not that long ago that it was not at all popular to talk about adaptation or, you know, let alone to build a movement around it and to have young people rallying about adaptation and loss and damage. I remember being in a conversation, actually quite a heated conversation, with somebody from Greenpeace uh, at a COP in, in Bali. When was that, 2007? Mm -hmm. um, who, who was adamantly against discussing adaptation within the civil society community there because it was such a distraction from mitigation right as if the two have nothing nothing in in common or as if they have nothing to do with each other and and in the end and this is going back to the you know shame on you question as well if if we fail with mitig with adaptation that's not just because our ideas about adaptation our practices aren't sufficient it's also because we have failed on mitigation and that's where the two are connected, because if we fail on mitigation, adaptation becomes so much more difficult, because we'll have to adapt to higher global mean temperature, we have to adapt to higher sea level rise and, 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 and greater impacts. Um, so let's not forget that. Let's not, you know, even within climate policy, let's not talk about, you know, pillars and silos and all that sort of stuff. I mean, in the end, mitigation is still by far the first priority. But because it, you know, we have failed on mitigation for so long, the urgency to talk about adaptation and the need to talk about loss and damage has become so much greater. I would like to add one point, if you allow me. And it's also the danger of uh, green evangelism. And I'll give you a specific example that's playing out right now in the global community. We hear that African countries should not be producing fossil fuels. We hear the strong call, and this is playing out as in internal politics, that it's important that in all our reports, for instance, that we be careful not to encourage countries. I just came from Angola in producing and continuing their oil production. I think that's wrong. So we also have to be very careful not to fall into dogmatism. Because again, those that produce and are responsible for climate change are the ones that are the object and audience of this video, of, of our of our um, of our work and our discussion. We should make sure that in whatever we do going forward, we do not punish those that were not responsible. And in our global push for the end of fossil fuel production, African countries in particular will not be on that same timeline. For, for, for energy transitions. I give that example as a very pragmatic example of how also it can flip and the, the discourse can end up uh, leading to maladaptation as we've been saying in the practice. So another word of caution, adding to, to Richards. Thank you very much. Um, an applause uh, for our panel. Thank you very much. And um, we're now going to do a very quick change because um, we're pretty much the only thing holding you back from mingling and uh, drinking and getting to know each other. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Orsa Pachon to come up. Orsa is uh, SCI's research director, deputy director as well.
Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Really great to see a lot of uh, friends and colleagues here tonight. Um, so as the last speaker, I think my main job is to make you even more impatient for the cocktails and the canapes and the cake uh, out in the Great Hall. Um, but we really hope you will enjoy them and enjoy the socializing. Um, but I'm also here <clears throat> as a representative of the global family of SEI centers to really show our appreciation for not only the speakers tonight, but of course all the colleagues, uh, friends, partners, funders of SEI Oxford over the last 20 years. And last but not least, of course, the staff, which I think are the real stars of the evening for your really dedicated uh, work in these 20 years. Uh, so it's a bit of a paradox that we're in this natural history museum talking about the future of adaptation. But I think we heard some really good things from the first panel there. Maybe it's about scaling back rather than scaling up or scaling out adaptation. Maybe we need ministries of resilience. And really, there are no shortcuts around inclusion and empowerment. When walking in through these doors, uh, I'm sure some of you felt like me that this is really a sanctuary, uh, considering this vortex of change that we seem to be going through. Just in the last four days this week, uh, you know, we see these examples of climate crisis, economic crisis, geopolitical crisis. And I think as climate researchers, you know, we have been quite used to working in very systematic ways with our data and our tools. And we often have these five year horizons for our projects. But now reality is catching up with us very quickly. Just, I mean, in the last four days, uh, it's, it's ironic, really, that our fossil fuels experts at SEI hosted their third biannual conference here in Oxford on fossil fuel phase out and supply side climate policy. How can we achieve this orderly, responsible, equitable uh, transition out of fossil fuels? Also this week in Washington, our air pollution experts joined the meeting of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition talking about the Global Methane Pledge and you know, how can they work with countries to reduce their methane emissions in a sort of structured, cost-effective, practical way. In the same space of time, we have uh, gas pipeline leaks in the Baltic Sea, not far away from here. Uh, of course, we don't know exactly what has happened and why, but it seems to be maybe a sign of this toxic cocktail of fossil fuels, energy security, geopolitics. <laughs> Tonight, we're talking about adaptation. Uh, in this week, we have a hurricane hitting Florida, a typhoon in Southeast Asia, recently the floods in Pakistan, and of course, coming out of a, a heat wave summer across Europe. So, how do we manage with this vortex of change? Uh, what does it mean for climate research at SEI and I think more broadly in our community? Uh, and I think the last panel really nailed it. It was exactly the same points I wanted to make. I think what I would like to convey to our Oxford colleagues and uh, adaptation researchers you know, more widely is that it seems like we need to do two things simultaneously. One is to challenge ourselves, step up, think new. Uh, I loved hearing the examples from George. There we are. Uh, trying new things, looking in new areas for inspiration. So I hope the Oxford colleagues can use this anniversary this evening as a springboard for you know, thinking new, uh, questioning old assumptions. Uh, and I'm also pleased to say that at SEI globally, we are uh, exploring how we can consolidate and innovate our adaptation research, um, of course, together with the Oxford colleagues. So anyone in here who has, you know, ideas you want to discuss, please get in touch with Ruth and the team here. Maybe we can work together. The second takeaway, I think, is this need to really uh, still work on this cumulative knowledge building. Uh, I was really you know, pleased to hear um, 
insights from the, those of you who've been working for so many years on adaptation, uh, who really have this kind of institutional or collective memory, who, you know, bring us back to the core question of what works. You know, we have so many new concepts, new narratives, but at the end of the day, we need to know what make the lives of people better. Uh, planting mangroves, you know, it's a native-based solution, yes, but it's also planting mangroves. So, um, with that, I wanted to say enjoy the evening and a big thank you uh, again to the speakers joining us tonight, to all the partners and funders of SEI Oxford and last but not least, everyone at the Oxford Centre who have been involved in making this evening so special and nice for us to attend. So, a big round of applause and enjoy the conference.